Welcome back. I'm Ian Masters, and this is Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org. And joining us now is Alfred McCoy, who holds the Harrington Chair in History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the author of Policing America's Empire, the United States, the Philippines, and the Rise of the Surveillance State, and In the Shadow of American Century, The Rise and Decline of U.S. Global Power. And his latest book, Just Out, is To Govern the Globe, World Orders and Catastrophic Change. And he also has an article at Tom Dispatch, Catastrophic Global Disorder Beckons Unless We Act Swiftly on Climate. Welcome to Background Briefing, Alfred. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for joining us. And there are so many indications catastrophic climate change is happening, and it's happening at an increasing race, almost exponentially increasing, with these feedback loops, particularly with methane. And, of course, as the polar ice cap melts, the oceans rise, and light that normally is reflected back into outer space from the white snow caps is then absorbed by the dark ocean, and thus climate change worsens. But there's just one example now in Antarctica of a glacier that's about to break loose and form hundreds of icebergs that one glacier in Antarctica could cause sea level rise of up to two feet. I mean, this is extraordinary. I feel like we're all sort of sleepwalking when all of this evidence is piling up in our face. Yeah, the, the evidence for the damage of the poles, which are sort of far from our vision and far from our consciousness, is really quite striking. The United Nations in its uh, Paris Agreement uh, back in 2015 said that we we could contain most of the damage if we reached uh, just global warming at 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade. And they said that at 2 degrees centigrade, it would be really disastrous for the world, and that should be avoided at all cost. Well, um, when you speak about these temperatures for the whole planet, what you have to realize is that uh, it's not evenly distributed. The, 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 the columns of air moving from the hot tropics come down on the poles, and so, therefore, the, the Arctic and Antarctica, and particularly the Arctic, is already at 2 degrees centigrade right now. So they're already at this disaster level. And uh, their, their, their global warming is basically twice that of, uh, of, of the rest of, of the world. Uh, and that is having profound effects uh, upon, first of all, the polar ice caps. You just described the, the massive uh, melting of the, the Thwaites Glacier in Antarctica. And, uh, of course, the same process is going on. Uh, within 20 years, there will be no more summer sea ice in the Arctic, which will remove a kind of white shield that uh, bounces back much of the, the power of the sun at the pole. Moreover, the vast permafrost, which covers about a quarter of the entire northern hemisphere, which is this vast store of, of carbon dioxide and methane, from ice ages past, that that's melting uh, erratically and dangerously, and uh, releasing all kinds of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So the the trajectory for the 21st century is is pretty gloomy. Now, what I tried to do in the book was go beyond the climate science and and use the climate science uh, to make predictions about the changing nature of global power. You know. Climate science is actually, among the social sciences and pure sciences, is really unique. Let's say political scientists will predict maybe the next election. Economists will go out as far as the next recession. But what environmental scientists do is they project um, the likely increase in, in, in global warming for the rest of the century. They go out nearly 100 years. Uh, and they make you know a range of predictions you know for maximum uh, disaster to minimum disaster. Um, and, of course, it looking like it's the maximum that's likely to happen. So what I did in my book, To Govern the Globe, was to simply take that environmental science, and they're very clear, mathematically sophisticated, scientific project projections. And I tried to lay on top of that the future direction of global power, the, the political impact of climate change. And what I found was two things. Uh, first of all, Washington's world order which has governed the globe for the past 70 years, is likely to, to collapse sometime around 2030. And Washington's world order included 
international organizations such as the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization, and hundreds of international organizations, governed, if you will, or organized by a rule of law. But within them, perhaps more importantly of all, was a spirit of international cooperation, a culture of cooperation, if you will. And as climate change is accelerating, that, that, that culture of cooperation is beginning to break down. If we think just about the recent past from 2016 to 2018, the arrival of Mideastern refugees uh, in, in Greece, uh, African refugees crossing the Mediterranean to, to Italy and Southern Europe, and then Central Americans and some Mexican refugees, many of them, all these climate change refugees, reaching the U.S. border. This produced a, a surge of hyper-nationalist reaction. Britain's Brexit, leaving the European Union, the rise of ultranationalist parties in, in Europe, and then, of course, the election of Donald Trump under the campaign slogan, Build the Wall, to keep out the Central American migrants. And when you add up the Middle Easterners, the Africans, and the Central Americans, that's only 2 million people. Well, by 2050, and it, it's, it builds every year to 2050, the World Bank is, is projecting at least 200 million climate change refugees. And the latest estimate is as many as 1.2 billion climate change refugees. That's people that are not migrating by choice, but as climate change pounds the, the seashores and, and floods the floodplains and turns the desert fringe into desert, people are set in motion. They have to move in order to survive. And so what is going to happen, I think, is, and it's already happening, uh, is the international cooperation, which is the, the if in many ways, the, the central ethos of the Washington World Order is going to collapse. And China is not only challenging U.S. global power, economic and military, but China is also creating or offering an alternative international order that sets aside the human rights that have been synonymous with Washington's world order, sets aside the rule of law, and basically has a kind of transactional national self-interest ethos of international exchange. In other words, the end of cooperation. So there's lots of reasons, and we can talk about all those reasons, why, why China is likely to supplant the United States by the end of this decade as the great global hegemon, and further, why, why, uh, why the Chinese global system will likely replace Washington's world order. But then the next question is, okay, so what happens to China's world order? How long will it last? Will it last 70 years like the American or 100 years like the British or 300 years like the Iberian world order? No, it looks like the Chinese world order is going to last maybe 20 or 30 years because uh, China is literally digging its own environmental grave by continuing to rely on fossil fuels for its domestic electricity and by promoting the construction of, of coal-fired electrical plants, dozens of them, as a part of its Belt and Road Initiative. So by 2050, uh, and the, the, the environmental science is very clear on this, the rising sea levels that you referred to in, in your introductory remarks, uh, that is going to flood Shanghai. Most of Shanghai, including much of its downtown, will be underwater. Uh, Shanghai was dredged from swamp and sea starting in the 15th century, and to the waters it will return. Not only that, but starting around 2060, uh, and maybe a little bit earlier, China is going to start, particularly the North China Plain between Shanghai and Beijing, which is home to 400 million people today. That heavily populated region, that agricultural heartland of China, is going to be racked by devastating heat waves. And in the last decades of the century, the projections uh, are that China's North Plain will experience five periods of 35 degrees centigrade wet bulb temperature. Now, what does that mean? Okay, that's a temperature when the balance of heat and humidity is such that the human body can't sweat. So a healthy adult, seated, not moving at all, under 35 degree wet bulb temperature, will be dead in six hours. And so the, the North China Plain, China's agricultural heartland, will become one of the least habitable, if not the least habitable place on the planet by 2070. So, so when you do these projections, what you see is that roughly around about 2050, the world will not have a functioning international system. The U.S. global power will be long gone. 
China will be forced to retreat from its international obligations, such as they might be, to manage its own domestic crisis. And so the world is going to be faced with a need for a very new kind of global governance. Well, the global governance in terms of dealing with climate change, we just witnessed that in um, Glasgow, and they couldn't even agree on getting rid of coal-fired plants. You just mentioned how the Chinese are building them at a great rate, and China lobbied against the idea of phasing out coal, and the compromise was, in the language, was phasing down. So contrast that with what you're telling us, Alfred McCoy, and it's clear that we are not stepping up to the plate, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, you know, the, the, the Glasgow was a mix of, of good and bad news. For example, China and the United States, through the work of Ambassador John Kerry, uh, signed a joint agreement, made a joint announcement of their shared commitment to, uh, carb- to being carbon neutral, uh, to ending uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, very important accord. But then when you look at the fine print, that's where that phrase, phase down, first came in. China committed itself to phasing down coal, and they used this very tricky language. They said they would do this in their 15th five-year plan. Okay, well, That 15th five-year plan is set to start in 2025. So what China announced, and, and people did, the press did miss this, okay, what China announced is they won't even start curbing greenhouse gas emissions until 2025, basically five years from now. All right, and the clock is ticking. These are critical five years. All right? And then also at Glasgow, India said that they would be carbon neutral by 2070. Well, you know, uh, China, uh, just as China is digging its environmental grave by building these coal-fired plants, India's doing the same, because that same research that said that the North China Plain was going to be racked by you know, these heat waves also said that the second region of the world that's heavily populated that's going to have the same events, not quite as bad as China, but bad enough, is the North Gangetic Plain, which is in many ways the demographic heartland of, of India. Uh, so both of these powers, which together, India and China, account for 37% of cur- current greenhouse gas emissions, both of them are, are, are literally digging their own graves. Now, so what that indicates to me is the current voluntary system that we run by which we run the international order, which is very important and, and has many successes, okay, that it's just not sufficient to cope with this crisis. And so what I see is that as this climate crisis develops and worsens with each passing year, that, that there is likely, or there, hopefully one could even say, there will, there will be a, a pressure for the nations of the world to concede three small areas of their national sovereignty to a more empowered UN or similar organizations. Uh, uh, the first one would be that, uh, let's say around 2050, if any nation is still, uh, is still emitting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, they would be heavily sanctioned and, and, uh, and made to switch to carbon neutral energy that the UN could regard this, the international community could regard this as being tantamount to invading another country, which under the current world order should entail sanctions. A second thing would be that a successor to uh, the UN High Commissioner of Refugees, or a more empowered form of that office, would be charged with dealing with this this human tide. It's going to be something like one-seventh of humanity if that 1.2 billion figure of climate change refugees by 2050 is accurate. It could be that one-seventh of humanity will be in motion. And we, we have a choice between absolute global disorder. I mean, imagine it, you know, nations fighting over water, primordial struggles over land, you know, kind of chaos and violence spreading around the globe, uh, and nations closing their border, pushing back refugees with, with gunfire and tear gas and worse, uh, Boats full of refugees being shoved back into the sea to drown. I mean, it could get pretty grim. And so there would need to be, the, the voluntary resettlement of refugees would need to become mandatory. That nations in the temperate zone would be required to take their fair share of humanity. A third and final thing, uh, and you mentioned Glasgow. At Glasgow, there was much discussion of uh, significant financial aid. The, the, the wealthy nations are supposed to provide it under the Paris Agreement the poor developing nations with about $100 billion in in, uh, climate change aid. Well, they haven't done that yet. So these voluntary contributions would have to become almost mandatory. 
uh, and every nation uh, which was wealthy would be paying a, a kind of a tax surcharge to, to deal with climate change in the poor tropical regions. This would have uh, three effects. First, providing food so that people wouldn't starve. Second, uh, infrastructure to remediate climate change. And third, to uh, stabilize these societies as much as possible to minimize the flows of refugees. So it's actually a, a program in everybody's self-interest. Now, the sum of these three reforms um, would actually, although it would be a very limited slice of national sovereignty, would create a kind of empowered global governance that hopefully would have sufficient authority to at least cope with the crisis. Welcome back. I'm Ian Masters, and this is Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org, and we're continuing the conversation with Alfred McCoy, who holds the Harrington Chair in History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the author of Policing America's Empire, the United States, the Philippines, and the Rise of the Surveillance State, and In the Shadows of the American Century, The Rise and Decline of U.S. Global Power. His latest book just out is To Govern the Globe, World Orders and Catastrophic Change, and he also has an article at Tom Dispatch, Catastrophic Global Disorder Beckons Unless We Act Swiftly on Climate. Now, as you point out in your piece at Tom Dispatch, in terms of global hegemony, that the United States will probably be the hegemon continuing up until about 2030, and then Beijing will take over. And, but its hegemony will only last about 20 years uh, until 2050 because of uh, the ravages of climate change. But at the moment, the facts are pretty grim, and that is that contrasting China with the United States, here we have, we've lost 800,000 people to COVID. They've only lost a few thousand, as much as we know, um, their statistics. So there's a contrast there. But also, China has accumulated a vast hoard of cash, about $4 trillion, uh, in the same period that the United States has wasted about $8 trillion in pointless and fruitless wars in the Middle East. So we're our own worst enemy, and we lost four years under Trump in terms of dealing with climate change. And now that the Republican Party is rigging the next elections in a shameless and brazen way, it's likely that Trump could come back. And he would he is, is such a catastrophe and such a fool and an amateur that he will accelerate America's decline. So how much are we our own worst enemy in terms of the massive challenges that you're laying out in your new book to govern the globe, world orders and catastrophic change? In, in many ways, uh, Ian, the U.S. decline has been something of a, a bipartisan project in Washington, D.C. The first and most fundamentally important decision was back in 2001, when we decided to admit China to the World Trade Organization and make them a kind of full member of the international capitalist club. Now, up to this point, the, the people that had been engaged in kind of mutual trade agreements had been industrial powers. So, in effect, we were swapping our Boeing jets for Germany's BMWs and Mercedes Benzes, that sort of stuff. Okay? Now, China, with 20% of the world's population, joined the World Trade Organization, and they uh, with incredible drive and discipline, they made themselves into the workshop of the world. We all know, as we we shop, how much of our uh, of our consumer durables come from China these days. And in 15 years, between 2002 and about 2016, China increased its its trade with the United States fivefold, and they accumulated that four trillion dollars in foreign exchange reserves, was, which was absolutely unprecedented. And they reached that peak in about 2014. About the same time, President Xi Jinping announced something that he called the Belt and Road Initiative. And when he stood up in Kazakhstan in Central Asia and proclaimed this initiative, he spoke of building a unified market through infrastructure that would link uh, Europe with Asia, that would stretch all the way from the Atlantic Ocean across the 6,000-mile breadth of the Eurasian landmass all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, since then, China has proceeded with giving out hundreds of billions of dollars in, in aid and development projects that have laid down a, uh, a trans-Eurasian grid of road, rails, and pipelines. Simultaneously, China has built a, a ring of 40 ports, 
screening the tricontinental world island of Asia, uh, Africa, <clears throat> and Europe. Uh, they they arc from Piraeus all the way to to Hamburg in Europe, and the combination of the string of ports and uh, the the transcontinental grid is is uh, unleashing new kinds of trade and commerce, which is flowing to Beijing. And if that continues, as if by natural law, Beijing will emerge as not only the world's preeminent power, but the center of the global economy. And indeed, the international accounting firm PricewaterhouseCoopers has predicted, and this is a pretty modest prediction, that by 2030, China's economy will be 50% larger than America's. And since China and the United States spend about 2 and 3% on average, over the long over the long period of their gross domestic product on on defense, when China's economy is 50% bigger than America's, its defense budget will be correspondingly bigger. China is already a near peer in, in, with the United States in military power. In fact, in some critical areas like security of satellite communications and um, any missile defenses. China's already ahead of the United States. And as, as they continue to apply artificial intelligence to their military, to invest heavily in military technologies, by the end of this decade, China will be a, a, not just a near-peer competitor, but a peer competitor with critical advantage in a number of really significant military areas, particularly, particularly if there's any conflict, as it's likely to be if there will be a conflict, uh, close to China's coast. Uh, the sheer distance, the width of the Pacific gives the United States an enormous disadvantage, and, and China would defeat us in any kind of conflict fought anywhere off the coast of Asia. So all of this means that China's rising. Now, another aspect you mentioned, Ian, was while China was building this industrial complex, becoming literally the workshop of the world, uh, and investing these, these foreign exchange profits in that, in that, in that effort, the United States took that $8 trillion and invested it in, in the Middle East, uh, invading Iraq and invading Afghanistan. And if there was an economic logic to it, we were going to turn the green zone in Baghdad into the epicenter of kind of an American imperium in the Middle East that would give us a, a secure hold over the oil of the Middle East. That was the only reason to be there economically. Well, in effect, we invested $8 trillion in securing the world's oil just at the time that oil was joining cordwood and coal in the dustbin of history. In other words, it was a gross strategic miscalculation. So the combination of these bungled decisions by Washington, admitting China to the World Trade Organization, you know, in investing our military might in the Middle East, letting China grow unchecked, all of that, you know, basically preordained America's global power to decline. And it was all imperial hubris. I mean, you you look back to the kinds of things that were said in the 1990s up to 2001. You know, that was when we were, we were talking about um, the end of history, that the whole world would be transformed into, into free market democracies following the U.S. model, that there would be, that, 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 that the end, history would end because this was the destiny of humankind for all times, okay? Uh, that was an extraordinary period of imperial hubris. And, and our downfall was very quick indeed. And meanwhile, in the real world, the world uh, that we all share, lifeboat Earth, if you will, global carbon dioxide emissions rose by a staggering 50%. I'm reading from your article, uh, Al staggering 50% from 22.2 gigatons in 1997 to a peak of 33.3 gigatons in 2019. So that's the reality we're dealing with. And we talk, started out talking about how a giant glacier in Antarctica could peel off into the ocean and cause a sea level rise of two feet, which is just extraordinary. That could happen relatively soon. So when you talk about the need for the UN to come up with sort of a new global governance regime, it obviously is necessary to meet the horrendous challenges. But knowing how chaotic things are now, 
uh, and how much national rivalry is dictating what's happening. I mean, the Chinese basically think that the United States is a fading power and that they know that they're a rising power. And the communist government basically feels that the United States is trying to sabotage China's rise. So there's a lot of bitterness there. And you know that China and Russia has just had a, the leaders met 37 times. They just had a virtual meeting last Wednesday. So my sense is that what you're talking about in terms of new global governance structures of dealing with refugees and climate change is probably incredibly optimistic that the reality may be much grimmer. Well, uh, Ian, you're, you're accurately speaking on two levels, one about kind of global governance um, and the other about the, the hegemonic power of individual superpowers, China, the United States, Russia. Okay, uh, and, and the two operate kind of in tandem. At the end of World War II, the United States used its extraordinary global power, its, its, its victorious military and an economy that controlled half the world's industrial production. And it used that to build an international order, the United Nations, uh, grounded in the rule of law and in a spirit of cooperation. And at critical points in the history of the United Nations and in this global governance, U.S. Global, US hegemonic power has been critical to sustaining this structure. So the question we're faced now is can this international order of, of international cooperation, the UN and all the rest, can that survive the decline of American hegemony, uh, of American imperial power? And as I said earlier, China is not only trying to supplant the United States as the global hegemon, but it's trying to construct an alternative international order that um, sets aside human rights, the rule of law, and all the rest. And so that's a critical uh, question we're facing. In terms, at the level of, of imperial power, uh, the, chain, the, the, the relations between Russia and China that you mentioned are actually, I think, very important. Um, these are the two great Eurasian powers. And Russia and China were briefly allied at the start of the Cold War under Stalin and Mao, with Stalin being dominant and Mao being the kind of the aspirant communist leader. Then the Sino-Soviet split occurred. They became really hostile at the point of near, near war. Uh, with China constructing massive civil defense, not against the U.S., but against against the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, now, for you know, really since the first time since the, the early years of the Cold War, China and Russia are, are closely allied. They're both members of uh, China's equivalent of NATO, the China, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, they have joint military maneuvers. And they're both allied at trying to to break the... U.S. dominance of Eurasia. Look, one thing I established in the book, and I deploy geopolitics in the book, the study of geopolitics, and what I discovered was, was, was that over the past 600 years, there have been a succession of global hegemons, um, Portugal, Spain, <clears throat> Holland, Britain, the United States, and now China. And despite the, the, the long span of time and the incredible diversity of these nations, they all shared one thing in common in their bid for global power. They all dominated the Eurasian landmass. During the Cold War, the United States controlled the axial ends of Eurasia through the NATO alliance in the West and through four bilateral mutual defense pacts in the East with Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, and Australia, all signed in the same year, 1951. And then the United States overlaid on top of that rings of steel, the six a uh, fleet of the U.S. Navy in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, the Seventh Fleet in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, and then most recently, 60 drone bases stretching from Sicily all the way to Guam. Okay, so now Russia and China are cooperating in punching through these rings of steel that the United States laid down over Eurasia, which was the key to U.S. geopolitical power. And they are systematically breaking U.S. control. Moreover, Trump's battering of NATO during his four years in power convinced the Europeans that they couldn't really rely on NATO anymore, and they began moving uh, towards a kind of shared or common European defense organization that would be separate from NATO. China's economic spread is weakening our 
relations with those four key allies that I mentioned, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, and, and Australia. Uh, and so it looks like China and Russia together are breaking the U.S. hold over Eurasia. And it's important to realize that that Eurasia is the epicenter of world power. It, it contains 70% of the world's population and productivity. You know, and then you know there's some secondary areas like you know Latin America and North America. Okay, but but Eurasia is the epicenter of world power. So if China and Russia dominate Eurasia together, break U.S. control, they will become the world's great global hegemons for the at least for the foreseeable future. But the foreseeable future is not particularly. A future we want. That's the no. overriding fact. So the challenge here is to get off this sort of bad habit of nationalism and discover the necessity of internationalism in the face of a common threat. Yeah, but I agree. But the kind, the, the, the sorts or the portions of sovereignty, the very slender slices of sovereignty that the nations of the world would need to give up in order to create a, a, a global instrument, a global governance capable of managing, well, first of all, reducing climate change and managing the consequences, the very real economic, social, and human consequences, would be actually quite small. It just governs the emissions. In other words, we now have you know, a way of moving away from coal-fired electrical plants, you know, solar, wind, and actually, okay, and this is not so popular, but nuclear, in order to provide the constant generation to fill in for the blanks in the in the in the solar and wind power. Okay, so we have non-emitting sources of energy that we can readily develop very very quickly. All that takes is the investment of capital. It's an enormous market opportunity for small entrepreneurs doing solar panel installation, all the way to, to major financiers that would finance the transformation of electrical grids. We can can do this, okay? So that's not a big deal, all right? Second, the resettlement of refugees. We already have a UN High Commissioner of Refugees. We already have protocols and procedures for doing this. All we need to do is expand them and make them mandatory so that every nation around the world does it. So it doesn't become, uh, well, like what Belarus just did with Poland and Europe, you know, attracting Middle Eastern refugees, sending to the border, you know, creating a crisis on the Polish border in order to, to make a diplomatic ploy so that the, the dubious president of Belarus could maintain his office and legitimacy. All right? So you know, that, those kinds of cynical games that are being played with the refugees, uh, if the nations of the world agreed that, that they, would, they would participate as a common project in the recent refugees, again, that would end that. That would make that a rational process. And then finally, the transfer of aid. The, the nations of the world have already agreed in, on, in the process. We've set a figure of $100 billion. It's just a question of, of extending that and maybe transferring it from voluntary to mandatory. These are very slender concessions of national sovereignty, and people would still have the constitutions, their national languages, flags, the whole bit, right? So this doesn't take a great deal. And, you know, when you think about, you know, how far we've come with the U.N., back in the late 19th century, when the first international conferences were set up talking about international agreements to end war as an instrument of, of national power, um, the idea of, of something as powerful as the U.N. seemed almost preposterous. And yet the, the U.N. actually does have some real power. I mean, it, it, it actually does use it. Um, take, for example, Cambodia. Now, at the end of Pol Pot's murderous regime, in which he killed about one-seventh of his population uh, under the Khmer Rouge, Cambodia was writhing in agony. The nations of the world got together. They were tired of the great power politics that China and the U.S. were playing with Cambodia, and they created a international government called UNTAC, the UN Transitional Authority for Cambodia, they used UN peacekeepers as the army. They came in. They took sovereign control over Cambodia. They ran its schools. They ran education projects. They rebuilt its economy. They rebuilt its army. Uh, they set up its parliament, and then they, then they left. So the UN actually does have some real power. Right. Well, Al, we've run out of time, but I thank you so much for this conversation. 
it's grim, but it's real, and I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Pleasure being on. And again, I've been speaking with Alfred McCoy, who holds a Harrington Chair in History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's the author of Policing America's Empire, The United States, the Philippines, and the Rise of the Surveillance State, and In the Shadows of the American Century, The Rise and Decline of U.S. Global Power. And his latest book, Just Out, is To Govern the World, World Orders and Catastrophic Change. And he has an article at Tom Dispatch, Catastrophic Global Disorder Beckons Unless We Act Swiftly on Climate. This has been Background Briefing. I'm Ian Masters, and I'd like to thank producer Graham Fitzgibbon. And to help us sustain this program into the future and assure it remains free to all, please take a moment to support us by going to backgroundbriefing.org slash donate or publictruthmedia.org, where you will find our nonprofit Public Truth Media Foundation, where your tax-deductible donations, large and small, keep us broadcasting. And if you missed any of today's program and would like to explore our vast archives, you can find us at backgroundbriefing.org, where we'll include extended interviews searchable by topic and have made it easy for you to sign up for daily email updates that provide links to resources, articles, and books discussed on the program. Also, you can find links there to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we also encourage your ratings and reviews on these platforms. Find us on Twitter and Facebook at Ian Masters Media. And please do help us reach more listeners by sharing this program with friends, family, and colleagues. And I'll be back again tomorrow with another Background Briefing at backgroundbriefing.org. Bye for now. The guy that next door in Took the kids to the park and disappeared by half